Hi everybody and welcome. My name is Diederik Klopper and I'm the host of the Voices in Payments podcast season 2, in which we'll talk all about the ABCD of payments. Throughout this season, I will be inviting payment experts to talk about artificial intelligence, blockchain, cloud and data, and how these apply, overlap and drive winning business strategies in current day fintechs. In season two, I'm joined by directors, VPs, and other senior payment experts who oversee these business operations. But even more often, I'm joined by C-level executives, partners, and founders who've leveraged these technologies to generate immense growth. Today, I'm joined by a seasoned payment professional with sales and man management experience across the industry, including financial institutions, processors, and networks. She's a big lover of payment innovations with a focus on instant payments and open APIs, as well as a good understanding of the impact of regulations. She has the ability to quickly build and motivate sales teams. Our guest of today is Sylvia Mensdorf, the Senior Vice President of Sales for Banking Europe in FIS. FIS is at the heart of the commerce and financial transactions that power the world's economy. FIS is passionate about helping businesses and communities thrive by advancing the way the world pays, banks and invests, serving more than 20,000 clients in more than 1 million merchant locations over 130 countries. In today's show, Sylvia and I will go in-depth into core banking systems, modernization, blockchain, artificial intelligence and data and much more. So let's get right into it. Sylvia, a very warm welcome to the show. Thanks. Wonderful to be here and thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you. Uh, Sylvia, uh, you've heard our first series of the podcast. Uh, you know how it always starts. Uh, how did you stumble into payments? Well, you know, I, I can say, I honestly say I did stumble completely into payments. <laughs> so my background is in organic chemistry, nothing to do with payments. Uh, nope. <laughs> and, um, and then I, um, I did a, a master in business administration. Uh, and while I was doing that, this guy from then the Dutch telecom company came to present about Chipper. And so mm -hmm. this is the, you know, mid 90s and, uh, no, and towards the end of the 90s. And he started talking about putting a chip on our magnetic stripe cards and all the endless possibilities and, and the customer journeys and what that would enable. Yeah. And I got really enthusiastic about that. And then when I was finished with my studies and started looking for a job, there was a job for a junior product manager there. And, and so I thought, hey, so, so I did an interview to this day. I don't know why uh, <laughs> my then boss hired me, but he did. So I started in, you know, in, closed loop wallet purses and you know days long gone are are that and that's yeah. how i got into payments. but i did i did use it back in the days quite a lot to chip yeah yeah so, yeah. so it they finally found the 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 nook for it which yeah. was really in 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 canteens in, yeah, in public in transport restaurants and things restaurants, like that yeah, yeah the, the functionality if you think about it is now completely replaced by by what is open loop contactless uh, yep. nfc payments but the, but the idea was uh was i think great and 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 to to say what attracted me to it is on the one hand side it's technology uh but on the other hand it's something payments is something that touches all of our lives all the time and it's yep. something that improves our lives is something that I can experience, that my kids can experience, and and so it's you know I, I feel like I can I can make life better with technology and comp contribute uh, to that, and that's yeah, exactly. what's kept me fascinated. Yeah, payments is indeed fully incorporated in all of our lives, uh, and and you've been working in the industry like you said already from the mid nineties. Uh, how did that from chipper? Uh, how did your career progress onwards? Well, so funnily enough, after three months the company got acquired uh, by ACI uh, and I, I worked there for quite a long time and uh, you know got further fascinated moved into a, a sales position and really enjoyed working in the industry getting to know everybody in the industry and understanding this and it, you know I, I always explain to people that I love to pay which is kind of weird but, you know, it's like my, my husband, my kids laugh about it. One of my favorite stories is going to um, skiing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so um, 
I have three kids. We go to ski in Austria. Unfortunately, not this year, but every year we go to ski in Austria. And so you know what it's like when you get into your car mm -hmm. with your kids on a trip, right? You get into the car. You know it's a long trip. You turn the corner from the house. The first person says, "Are we there already?" I'm like, "Duh, no, we're not." And the next person says, "I gotta pee." Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we used to have to pack this jar of coins to pay for all the kids to go and be able to pee until a couple of years ago we get to germany the german autobahn very clean toilets and 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 we get we stop and i take the three kids to pee and lo and behold you can pay with your nfc card to pee no that in germany you need a jar. <laughs> and i was so enthusiastic about it i got back to the car this was with oh, you won't believe it i can pay with my car to E and my husband's like, you really have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Since then we call it PJ. Um, but uh, anyway, it's like you know, it makes a big difference. We always struggle to find the coins. Yeah, yeah. I I, I never carry cash around anymore. It's uh, it's funny that I still carry my cards around uh, everywhere I go, uh, just on a, a small sticker behind my uh, my phone. Yeah. Uh, I hardly ever use them. It's all Apple Pay that I use, but. Still, it's embedded in my system. And every now and then when my battery dies, I'm glad I do. But that's once in a quarter or, or something like that. I would I'm sooner forget my phone. Sorry, I'm currently finding the problem with paying with Apple Pay is that if it's face recognition, you know, yeah. you have your mask on. <laughs> yeah, mask luckily, on. luckily, I have an old phone that doesn't work on face recognition. So, But then you have to take I, off I, your gloves. I consider and, uh, <laughs> going back a couple of... Uh, mobile phones versions just to yeah. enable the pandemic version of apple <laughs> i can't imagine i can't imagine and then, uh, you, so you spent 20 years at, at aci which is a, a rare feat it's uh, not a given these days that people spend so long at a, at a certain employer so that that does mean uh, that you enjoyed it there but then made the the, the step to fis can okay, you tell us a bit more about the challenge that you found here that uh, that you wanted to explore yeah so so I, I joined FIS now six months ago, and there are a couple of things that uh, attracted me to FIS, right? The, the size of the company is incredible. And when you look at the fintech space these days, then size matters. Yep. Um, you know, the bigger getting bigger. Uh, and that, that was one of the things. And, and, and FIS, you know, we've just been, uh, been named Fortune 500, one of the most admired companies. So, you know, clearly FIS is doing something right. But what really attracted me to it was the combination of assets that FIS has, which now, which brings together on the one hand side, a huge pedigree on the payment side, both on the retail and uh, on the wholesale side, as well as core banking, where there is a huge amount of development going into what we call the modern banking platform, which is very much taking core banking into what it needs to be in open banking and bringing both of those two together, I think is a really, really exciting space. And it, it enabled me to, to pursue my, my passion, which is payments and Europe at a, at a bigger scale. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so that's what's, you know, haven't re regretted it a single day. So it's a great company to work with. Uh, happy to hear that. And perhaps for those who uh, are familiar with FIS, um, uh, personally, I became more familiar with FIS with the acquisition of WorldPay. But for those who uh, are familiar with the company, but not familiar in which aspects of the payment value chain you are operating, can you just highlight some of the, the services that you provide? Because they are sure. extensive. So, so I think the best way of starting that discussion is to highlight the tagline that FIS has, which is to improve the way the world banks, invests and pays. And if you think about it, it's really those three things. So if we start with investments, mm -hmm. there's a, a, a whole branch of FIS around capital markets, which is very well established and, and has continued to grow and originates from the Sangard acquisition. And I work very closely uh, with those colleagues, especially in some of the banks that I service. Yeah, then the, there is, there was even before the acquisition of WorldPay, a very big uh, merchant uh, um, business, but we are now the world's biggest acquirer yep. with that acquisition of WorldPay and we're solidifying and expanding, expanding that. 
but then obviously the, there is the banking space. And then if you look at specifically my, my remit, um, it's really around four core things. Um, core banking, mm-hmm. uh, where, where the modern banking platform uh, is going to help our customers bring core banking systems into the modern world and connect them and, and bring all those customer journeys and connectivity and, and functionality that, that people are, are looking for. It, it is around uh, uh, developing and for the further bring to market uh, OPF, which is through the clear to pay acquisition, our payment payment engine that serves tier mm-hmm. one banks, but that we're also making available as a payment as a service. And you can see that that's really an interesting part where, where you're looking at some, some customers really enjoy the license model and want to yeah. bring that to life in, in their data center or the cloud. Uh, other banks prefer to outsource that as, as a service. Then, you know, if we look at the card side, it's very complementary to, uh, to the merchant business where FIS serves the acquirers. We have uh, a lot of processing that enables issuers uh, mm-hmm. to issue credit, debit, and prepaid cards. And it's a very exciting space. And we, I, I suggest we talk a little bit more about that space and how yep. some of the fintechs that we, we serve in that space. Uh, and, then, and then the fourth is around something that's called platform securities, which is um, something, um, a, a service that we have in the UK that's very much um, uh, around security trading and and supporting that and underlying all of that we provide um, bpo services so it's quite a a wide um wide offer that we bring to the table as fis and and for those who are not familiar bpo is short for business process outsourcing right exactly yeah Yeah, so so supporting you know really bundling up not just providing the processing but actually taking on the call center and you know even statement printing all sorts of things uh yeah. Yeah. Cool. And then to so we mentioned four uh, uh, service lines basically. Um, the first one was core banking. You mentioned hey, it's we're now bringing it to the modern age. What what is the main gap that needs to be covered in in modernizing the core banking services? Well, it's really making the engines API available uh, and 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 modularizing it in such a way that every bank and every part of the bank can construct the customer journeys that, that, that they're looking for and, and really linking that into all the other systems that the banks have. When you think about kind of more legacy core banking systems, mm-hmm. then they're very monolithic and, and oftentimes, unfortunately, still not 24-7 which if you think yeah. about open banking, if you think about real-time payments, and the you 21st century. find <laughs> that banks have to actually put a system in front of their core banking that does authentication and authorization in real time versus the monolithic banking uh, engine that they have in the back. And, and today still a, a lot of banks, you know, build those core banking en- engines. Um, you know, I would say in the seventies, uh, yeah. and have kept them alive um, and, and that is, is it's a huge burden and it's standing in the way of some of the uh, the modernization that is required it's obviously you know replacements and 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 building up core ba- you know replacing a core banking engine you know you can, you can equate that to open heart surgery yeah that is yeah. very very lengthy so you get have to get it right and this is where the risks are, of course, significant. And, uh, you have to migrate uh, from one platform to another. And if that doesn't work well, then uh, the implications are massive. But I've always been baffled with how extremely complex it is and why why even major companies like FS are, are struggling or at least taking longer than I thought it would take. But uh, the more I, I dive into it, the, the more complex it begin becomes. And uh, then I start to see, okay, this is one of the reasons why it's uh, it's so, so complicated. Well, there, there's huge risks and what you see, and I think that that is oftentimes the right approach is that things are phased and you kind of find a business case. Mm-hmm. Because oftentimes it's really the hurdle of, you know, do we find the investment? Where do we spend our time as a, as a company 
from, yep. from the bank's perspective, I, I would say that the advantage of a company like FIS is we don't walk away from products, uh, projects, <laughs> and products. You have the resources well. to take them on. No? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's really important when you're taking on a project like that. You want a partner that is financially stable, that you know is going to see it to the end. Uh, and and you know, it's, if you look at the investment that we're putting into modern banking platform, you know, huge experience over more than forty years. And then the type of investment that a company like FIS can put into a system like that, it's, it's incredible. So it's really exciting to bring that uh, to bring that to Europe. Yeah, we're excited as well. <laughs> and then let's talk a bit, you mentioned hey, uh, card uh, issuing, had debit credits uh, and prepaid cards, and had that most likely will make a, a massive impact in the fintech industry. What are some of the projects that you're currently working on and some of the developments that you're most interested in? Yeah, so so that space is so exciting um, because when you when you think about the the kind of fintech revolution, uh, originally a, a lot of thinking was that a lot of fintechs would start on the banking side, so they would bring a core engine uh, yeah. to the market, and and some have done that, but you've got other fintechs who kind of thought, hmm. You know, it's really about the, the customer journey. How do I enable those customers? What is something new that I'm bringing to the market? So we've actually seen a different cycle where, where companies start on the card side and they think, oh, let me bring out a, a prepaid card. And, and with a prepaid card, you can really hone it in to yep. serve a particular uh, a market. So we have some customers um, that are, for example, focused on how can we enable parents to help their children become more uh, aware of their spending patterns. Yeah, be more aware of their spending patterns. And I, I'm really enthusiastic about that being a parent myself. You know, that's one of the things so I hate cash, never carry it. <laughs> but when, when you think about it, paying is a trade. Yeah, yeah. It, it's money was invented to help us trade more effectively. We had that discussion uh, when we met the first time. So help us trade more effectively. For children, when you say, I want an ice cream, here is mm -hmm. five euros, that, that is a physical trade. It's much easier to understand. Yep. And then, you know, when you have small children, you always find when they get really enthusiastic, when they give a five euro note and they get coins back and they kind of go, I got more back. That's than a massive, paid. that's a massive trade. <laughs> oh, so, so but, but with that physical uh, nature of cash, teaching your children the value of man money and that you're having to give something to get something is easy. Yep. Well, it's us digital. now being in a world yep. where this is digital, it's much harder to explain to children that, you know, there, it's not an endless well where this comes from. Yeah, and how it's still a, a two-way transaction. Indeed, normally you yeah. give something which you don't have after giving it, and you receive something which you now have didn't have before. And if you are tapping using NFC with your card, you still have your card, and you get the the, the product. So there's yeah. a discrepancy there. That there's uh, a discrepancy there, and 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 you know companies that are in that space are helping parents educate. Well, what I've found is one of the best tools to to educate is my. Uh, my uh, teenagers are now working mm -hmm. yep. and, and that they suddenly go, Oh, so I need to work for five hours to make 25 euros. Yep. <laughs> so that means if I want to buy this hundred euro thing, it's going to be four working, you know, like days. That, yeah. That's kind of how, how they equate it. But that, but that was the way that I sense. really got equated with that idea as well. It, it took exactly. me some time. So, but, <laughs> so it, but, but in, in that, so, so it's great that you can define these customer journeys. So, the, so that's one part that's really exciting. And, and then as you can, as you think about some of these, they're developing um, also you know, they, st they potentially started with a card product, but you can see them move and think about, okay, what more can I enable on the payment side? What more can I enable on the banking side? So, you know, you can kind of bring the, the circle together of all of these things and helping people be, be more financially savvy. Yeah. And the other thing that, that is really exciting, is, you know, we had the 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 news yesterday on on tesla uh, yes uh, and uh and investing one and a half billion in uh, bitcoin yeah 
you know, so 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 that's interesting that a company puts their assets there. Um, but but the other piece is, can I pay with Bitcoin? Now there's a lot going on that at some point you will actually be able to pay with your Bitcoin. No. Um, this, this was one of the reasons why they invested one and a half billion, right? Is they want to allow their consumers to make purchases on Tesla platforms with Bitcoin. And that's, of course, the first step. And I really hope that this will continue because this is, of course, the major downside. And one of the main reasons why Bitcoin is so volatile is that you, there's no actual means except trading. You cannot pay for anything uh, in, in store or in app. But, but what you see now is if you look at uh, some of the crypto exchanges, what they've done is they're, they're enabling their customers to have a payment card mm -hmm. that they link to their crypto assets. And in the transaction, translate from the crypto asset into fiat currency. Mm -hmm. and so while they're not directly paying with their crypto assets. So it, but it's an instant the, transition from crypto to... Uh, exactly. Uh, and ah, and, and so, so, so that's a, a way to get it into, uh, into real life. Because if you think about it, you know, Elon Musk is quite comfortable with, with Bitcoin. Uh, you can imagine that a lot of other businesses will not be that comfortable yeah. with Bitcoin because we all need to understand and, you know, that's one of the advantages and banes of payments and banking is regulation. It, we all understand that fiat currencies are very regulated and have the bucket backing of a gov government. Yep. If you think about the volatility of Bitcoin, you know, it's almost going back to the, uh, to the crisis of the thirties where, you know, you have, you don't know what's, what's going whether to your exchange is actually you know, solid. Yep. Um, and, 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 you know, is, is it how many, how many percentages of a Bitcoin is a Tesla worth? And yep. that changes every day. Whereas, you know, if I go out and buy my bread at the baker, it's, you know, two euro. You can expect what the price will be. Yep. Exactly. So, 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 but, but, but providing these alternative payments met methods is really interesting. And I think just making that bridge by, enabling that transition of, of crypto into fiat currency and just letting people pay, um, that's already a, a great step of making that, that asset uh, yeah. accessible. Um, and then you can imagine that, that these companies can go into, into uh, similar, they're already kind of in the investment business, then are going into the payments business. Yeah. By make it, and then you can think about, hey, you know, maybe I expand that services? into banking. Maybe I want to enable people to get a mortgage against the crypto assets. Yep. Yeah. So, so, so it's going to be quite, quite interesting how that develops. Still, I, I think the the challenge the crypto space has is the volatility, which which I think governments and and regulators spend a great deal of effort. <laughs> taking volatility out of the market and we all need to remember that 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 volatility can be very painful if it if it goes into our real economy yeah there's what well, most of the the news that you see about crypto uh, volatility are indeed the highs but you very very rarely see the lows uh, really clear uh, what what the consequences are i think and there are ample examples of people who lost nearly everything uh, by making a gamble into uh, Bitcoin, for instance, uh, and came out uh, yeah, a loser on, in that essence. Um, I, I, I would say it's it, at the moment it's still like the lottery, right? So if yep. you if you're happy to to go and play the lottery, great, then, go for yep. it, and you know don't worry about. If you're not worried about potentially losing that money, you can make a great deal of money. Yeah, but but th there's the catch. If you're not worried about yeah, potentially and, and, losing and, and that again, money. it's yeah. all about consumer protection. And, and this is maybe kind of goes if you think about other alternative payment methods. So, you know, the, 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 at the moment we have, with instant payments and card payments, there's a huge amount of debate about, okay, why are card payments so expensive mm -hmm. in, in parentheses? Because it's been very regulated uh, yep. uh, by government. So actually debit card payments, for example, in the Netherlands, ridiculously inexpensive. They're yep. very safe, they're very efficient. They always work, it, you know, it, and, 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 you know, 
the, the Dutch government actually did research a couple of years ago that proved that, that digital payments were cheaper to society than cash. On the back of that, the, 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 whole, the banks, the merchants, and a lot of other parts came together and, and made the, the ecosystem even more efficient. Yeah, so, so yeah. And, and, and now we're saying, okay, hey, we're too hung up on, on these two monopolies, MasterCard and Visa. We've got instant payments. Can we bring instant payments to, to the shops? Yeah. Uh, the whole European payment initiative, uh, for example, which is extremely interesting. The, the one thing that is required to really enable that is to build up the rules on the instant payment side to really cover cross schemes and, and, a, and a full fourth party model. Because at, at this point in time, yeah. if something goes wrong with your instant payments, yeah, the liability and the resolution lies with the individual or the company. Yep. Whereas mm -hmm. in, in these other payment schemes, there are very clear rules and there are whole schemes that sort out what happens when things go wrong? Yeah, exactly. Yeah? And, and, and that has taken 40 years to build out, but it's made it very efficient and it's provided, and most consumers don't realize that, but there is a huge amount of consumer protection built into that card system. Yeah. And it's indeed that, the liability shift, which, which on one hand explains some of the costs, but as well, uh, we could use the lessons that we've learned over those 40 years and implement them now in the European Payment Initiative, indeed. I've had a very interesting discussion with uh, Inge van Dijk of the Dutch uh, yes. Central Bank. Um, somewhere in, in this podcast series, it will be published, and uh, we'll, we talk a bit more about that. But it's a, it's a very interesting dynamic. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and she, brings, she brings that experience. And I've, I've always thought, you know, we, we've had that 40-year experience let's simplify but take some of the lessons learned but when people talk about oh this is going to be so much cheaper let's all remember that if <laughs> you have to build up yeah you know some type of protection now having said that you know some of the some of the methods work really really well uh and and because you've got mobile phones that are in the hands of the consumer um and 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 a lot more technology in shops. It you know it doesn't have to be as complicated as what was forty years ago. No, and there's technology developments uh, make it uh, uh, offer the possibility to make it a lot more frictionless and seamless. Uh, indeed, indeed. And um, talk a bit about uh, going back to cards because. And uh, there have been, of course, uh, a very interesting developments. We already mentioned uh, um, debit, credit, and, and prepaid, but as well the, the difference between uh, a virtual card and physical cards. Uh, how do you see that from a perspective of FIS? Is there still a solid future for the, for the physical card, or are we all going to transition to virtual card issuing in, in the near future? Uh, from our perspective, we'll, we'll support both, and it's really the business model of our customer that depends on that. You can see companies now starting to go out and say, hey, we, we won't even start issuing physical cards. We'll go directly to virtual cards anyway because people will be able to pay on their phone. Yep. Um, they, they, they will be able to, to pay with those virtual cards online and that takes cost out. Um, but, but we'll enable both until such time that that is no longer required. It, it's a means of communication as well, if you think about it, right? And if I, if I need to call my bank, I can look at my mobile phone, I can pull out my card and I look at the back and it says my number. And, yep. and funnily enough, you know, I, I've actually recently just started taking my card with me, which I'd left at home because of the, the whole yeah. pandemic thing. It's just <laughs> easier to tap and pay than yep. to take off. Remove your mask, scan yeah, face. Exactly. Yeah. So, 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 you know, I, I think the the physical card as a token of the connection between the issuing instance and the consumer Tumor. is yeah. is something that remains. It, I think this whole pandemic is proving to us that while the technology is great, we are physical beings, and yeah. having that that thing that shows ownership is still something that is deeply emotionally ingrained in us. So, so, so I think that that option will be there for a long time. 
Yeah, I agree. And I think the, even though that the virtual card offers a lot more flexibility, um, there are still some limitations, uh, like, for instance, battery life of the phones uh, or uh, accessibility. But and, and, and you don't, you know, you don't have to choose. It's really about what what is the journey that you want to enable? Who is your customer base? Yep. Um, I think I think, though, the really interesting thing, you know, kind of switching to the pandemic yeah, we can think about all the horrible things the pandemic has caused, but it's really exploded us into this digital world. If you think about what if this pandemic had happened 10 years ago, yeah, yeah. it would have been so much harder for all of us to connect. Well, we'd found a way because that's what we humans are good at. It, but, but, you know, the, the, the technology that was available to us has made this a, a more an easier transition, transition. Yeah. but it's also brought all of this technology to people that weren't normally used you know like yep. my mom didn't do zoom meetings she does zoom meetings with all her friends now yep. um, but it was my, just um, thinking about all the, the amount of shops that were online 10 years ago and that were online at the start of the pandemic and as well the ease of uh, uh, opening up a web shop uh, for a merchant uh, has drastically changed over the last 10 years. Indeed, that would have, the consequences would have been massively different and, 10 years ago. And all the shops that didn't have a online presence now have an online presence. Yep. At the flick um, of a button. Yep. And, 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 and all the consumer, you know, consumers that never thought they would actually buy online have all learned to buy online now. And, and once, you, you, once we as humans overcome our fear of technology and actually have a force to it, we suddenly go, oh, that wasn't yeah. that difficult. Oh, that wasn't that scary as I thought it was. It's actually easy. So once you have experienced the journey and actually feel like the, the comfort and, and the things, so you're not going to abandon that. So as I'm hoping the pandemic will end, <laughs> uh, I, I think some of the, the good things that it's brought to us will stay with us and will will actually bring bring uh, you know bring us even further into digitalization. Yeah, one of the things that examples I give is uh, I used to travel to Berlin quite often, a few times a year, and was always surprised with how dominant cash still is there and yeah. how even bars and restaurants that have stickers of MasterCard and Visa on the window don't accept card payments at all. Uh, I'm still super excited for the first time walking back into Berlin, walking into a shop and just being able to pay with card anywhere I want. Uh, and and I, I hear the stories I hear from, from people there are that it's already happening. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited. It's, it's a development that is forced upon us, but I think it's, it's a wall. That's part of the, the welcome developments that uh, that we've had uh, and and so for me i i have a german passport i used to live in 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 germany it's it's always been quite interesting to see the cultural difference between the way that people pay in different european countries yep and in germany cash in austria by the way cash was still so prevalent that atm payments were really really high and the interesting thing you know in, in the first wave of the pandemic oh all over the place, car payments crashed yep. because people were, were paying less in shops <laughs> versus in, in Germany where car payments actually rose, <laughs> <They're sword>. which <laughs> is weird. But if you think about it, yep. people were being told, don't use cash. So every time you go to an ATM, you take out cash, you can use that 100 euro to pay for five to seven purchases. purchases. Yep. Now you're not doing one transaction but you're pricing that one transaction with seven digital transactions. So you can imagine that while ATM transactions plummeted in Germany, the actual volume yeah. of hard transactions rose because of that. So, and again, I think once, once people get used to that, it, it does stay, but it, you know, it's one of the things that why this is fascinating to, to, to be in payments and be in Europe. Exactly. We're, we're in the right industry. <laughs> Absolutely. You have to pay always. You've got to eat, you got to pay. Yeah, exactly. And sleep every now and then. Yeah. And then eat, and eat, pay, repeat. Exactly. And uh, in this series, we're talking about the ABCD of payments, artificial intelligence, blockchain, cloud and data. Well, we've already talked about blockchain quite a bit, but 
And within a, a company like FAS, where does artificial intelligence, how, how dominant is that within, within your daily operations? Yeah, quite dominant. So there is a, a lot of, and there's a link between artificial intelligence and kind of going and from A yeah. to the D, yeah, artificial yep. intelligence and, and data. And data. So yep. we, we talked a little bit about the BPO services that we bring. So we've recently brought a new product uh, to the market called Epic which is taking artificial intelligence into a BPO services and combining that with data so that we can bring a lot more informed decisioning into our conversations in call centers, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for example. And then artificial intelligence plays a, a, a huge role um, when it comes to, to decisioning. So for example, when it comes to fraud detection, uh, when it comes to anti-money laundering uh, pieces. So everywhere where decisioning is playing a role, artificial intelligence and technology is being embedded into the solutions that, that FIS brings to market. And I can as well imagine that specifically with the, the size uh, that, that FIS has, there, there are so many operational procedures that uh, used to require manual input that the gain that you can receive retrieve from uh, automating and artificial intelligence is significantly higher than for a smaller company. Uh, is it as well why it's so embedded in your, your core strategy? Absolutely. But if you think about the, the business that FIS is in, ultimately it's the business of data and yeah. understanding that data effectively, it, it, artificial intelligence provides a huge lever on that. And if you think about the pool of data that, that we have uh, across the globe, it's actually quite fascinating, some of the, uh, the interesting conclusions that you can, can draw from that. So, so we're, we're really bringing that, bringing that out. And so, you know, so, so think about the impact that artificial intelligence can have on, on, on how we bring our solutions to market and customer journeys. Then, you think about, you know, we talked about crypto, we haven't talked about blockchain. So it's really yep. interesting to see how, you know, for example, the technology of blockchain can be used in trading transactions. I do have questions and I get into huge debates about this all the time. I don't think today the computing power is efficient enough to make blockchain truly viable for high volume mm -hmm. um, transactions. But when it comes about to ownership and being able to prove ownership, there is a lot of interesting uses of blockchain. And the distributed that, ledger is a, is a key uh, aspect of that. Indeed. Absolutely. And so, so that is very much uh, being uh, looked at in what we call our growth office. So we have a whole separate um, uh, unit that is very much looked at, okay, what are our next products? What's our innovation? And, and there's a lot of investment going into, into that piece. And then when you take that computing power to the cloud and, you know, I think I, I always find it funny because people talk about the cloud, you know, the cloud is just another data center, right? I don't know whether yep. they paint it pink, <laughs> but, you know, it's just another data center. But when, when you think about the, the public cloud and some of the investments that the that, that, that big tech is, is, is bringing to those, then that is really taking some of the responsibility of, for example, banks away from you know, investing into that underlying technology to being mm -hmm. able to invest into that other lying technology. Now, the, the very interesting discussion when it comes to cloud is initially it, it was thought that the cloud would bring a huge cost reduction purely on the infrastructure side. But when you look at it, it's not so much that, it will only bring that when, when customers embrace the fact that the cloud enables them to deliver functionality a lot more quickly. So yeah. it's a combination about what's your technology strategy on the one hand, and what is your development um, strategy on the other hand. And you really need to bring those together to really bring out the, the value of the cloud and, and, and being able to deliver these solutions a lot, a lot yeah. more quickly. And then for a company like FS, like you said, you have a, a 
yeah, I think one of the, the biggest sets of data in the, in the payment industry or the banking industry uh, all over the globe. So indeed having uh, that data stored in, in data centers that are cloud-based is key in order to gain access to that data. Uh, but as well, I can imagine that some uh, parts of the business are, are so sensitive and need to run so securely that for those you choose to run them on-premise instead of in cloud. Uh, how, how do you... Uh, design a uh, data strategy or a cloud strategy around that to identify, okay, to, first of all, to adhere to all the rules and regulations, because for instance, in Moscow, you need to have it stored within the country borders, Turkey, same, India, I think the same as well. And for other countries, it's more open. So how, how on such an enormous global scale, can you yeah, conduct a, a cloud strategy to adhere to all the, the rules and regulations, but as well make use of the, the possibilities that cloud offers? Yeah, so it, it's really a triple strategy. It's on-premise, it's a private cloud, and then it's public cloud. And you, you make that decision piece by piece. As you can imagine, uh, in a, the type of company that FIS is, it's like security first. Yeah. yeah? Uh, and, 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 you know, and, and I think everybody would want us uh, to function function that way. So it really depends on what is the service that we're providing, where are we providing that service, what are the rules and regulations, and and having having that security embedded. And and you know when I when I think about payments, it's you know availability, security, yeah, <laughs> and then everything else on top, right? Because we're dealing with people with money, and sometimes. You know, we we forget that when we're thinking about all the bells and whistles. But it's, you know, paying other than payment geeks like me, paying doesn't actually make people happy. <laughs> but it's like getting paid on the other about, hand. <laughs> yeah, it, it is like light, light and water, right? We expect yeah. the light to go on when we flip the switch. We expect yeah. hot water to come up when we step out of the shower. It, we only get extremely unhappy when it's not there. It's a hygiene factor, indeed. Yeah. yeah. So, so security, absolutely. Availability, absolutely, is is throughout everything that we do. That that is the basis that enables us to to even be part of the industry. Yeah. yeah. And then looking towards the future, uh, indeed, availability and security is key. Um, there are so many initiatives with indeed alternative payment methods, with the development of virtual card issuing, with cryptocurrency. What are you most excited about in, in the next two to three years? What, what are the developments that you're looking forward to? So I think it's really a lot of these things coming together and enabling new customer journeys that I'm most excited about. I think we're just at that point where you know, a lot of the things that we've talked about in the industry for years are going to become real to everyday businesses and everyday people. Uh, and, and I think that's where the proof of, of the pudding is. Can we bring instant payment to point of sale effectively yeah. in a way that people actually understand it? Because most people really don't get it, right? They don't care. They just want it to work. Yeah, um, exactly. But I, I do see an interesting dynamic that people are getting more interested in the payment itself, uh, at least in the, in the background. Uh, payment companies are becoming more out open in the public, uh, like Atien, like FIS, uh, you name it, that people are more aware that there's a lot behind the payment method, and especially with alternative payments like Klarna, like Afterpay. Absolutely. They are more concerned with it. So perhaps, indeed, it's right now the right melting pot to really make that transition and um, yeah, and, and uh, take the next leap. I think so. And I think the pandemic has driven a lot of that. And I always find it interesting. You look at the newspaper and there's always a story uh, uh, about payments. So it's not an industry that people don't understand or don't relate to. It's something that we do with everyday life, yeah. which is, again, why, why it's exciting to be a part of it. You can't, you cannot learn to be a payment expert. You kind of end up with it. But once yeah. you're in it, it's, you know, it's a wonderful industry. Exactly. I fully agree. I fully agree. And uh, yeah, within this industry, we always have interesting conversations like we had today. Uh, Sylvia, I want to thank you a lot for, for being on this podcast. Uh, I had an absolute blast. It was really fun. And uh, I think we uh, covered some interesting topics as well. 
thank you so much. And, uh, you know, hope we speak again. It's been I'm really... I'm uh, sure we will. Great time to spend. Speak I'm soon. I'm sure. Thank you. Bye.